stretch. All right. So let, let's start off uh, with a little bit of fun. Um, I want someone to finish this phrase for me. Sex, drugs, and... Rock and roll. <laughs> Excellent. Perfect. Although my answer is going to be a little more boring, which is responsible social media use. <laughs> and so, right, just think of health class. I mean, what, what is health care last? Sex ed. Drugs are bad. Don't do them. Don't, don't take them. And... <coughs> Now, with what many people call adolescent mental health crisis, uh, how can we more responsibly use, responsibly use social media? Of course, this is a panel discussion about polarization. And so social media also contributes to polarization. And so health class, for instance, is one example of how K-12 education may have a role to play to reduce political polarization. But of course, it's not the only one, and it wouldn't even be the obvious one. Obviously, these are political topics, and so we'd expect civics education, social studies, many activities that administrators could do could also be uh, quite important. And on this panel, we'll, we'll cover a lot of that. Um, I just want to say some thank yous uh, and, and kind of present some context before we actually jump into this, this conversation. So we'll, we'll talk for uh, 40 minutes or so, and then the last 20 minutes will be uh, questions from you here, and then there are many people online, and we don't want to forget you. Very important. Thank you for, for joining from who knows around, around the country, maybe around the world. Um, so first of all, I want to thank Bridget Mason for this amazing space, for being a wonderful partner with us uh, at, at Braver Angels. Um, so I am the co-chair of the DC Alliance for Braver Angels. Uh, some of you are very familiar with it. Some of you may have never heard of Braver Angels, one of the largest organizations committed to reducing political polarization in the US. And there are chapters, just like Bridge USA has chapters at, at different universities. Braver Angels has chapters in different cities. So you've had a DC chapter, and there are many volunteers here who helped to, to put this on. So thank you. Um, and there's also the Fairfax Alliance. Um, and so we're jointly hosting this with um, Bridget Mason. I um, want to thank all of you here. And I want to point out uh, one, one guest, so Eli. Uh, is a senior at Thomas Jefferson High School, and he's actually working on, on depolarization activities, so it, it makes sense, you know, if we're going to be talking about K-12 education, to have someone in K-12 education, right? Yeah. Yeah. Oh, it doesn't? I just, just feel so nice holding it here. Turn it on. Oh, it's not on? Hello? Oh. Uh, oh. It even works better now. Yeah. <laughs> Your joke <laughs> well, sorry for people online. I mean, uh, and and thank you to the distinguished panelists. As as we go through, uh, I'll introduce each of you in, in turn. Um, so, uh, just want to um, say some kind of yeah, contextualize this conversation. A little bit. Um, so, first of all, what is polarization that, that we're talking about? Um, when it comes to braver angels, it's more about how people feel and think about those who tend to identify in the other political party or vote differently from them. And so, this is something called partisan animosity or affective polarization. There's also distortions that people have about you know, those people that seem more threatening than they possibly really are. We are not out to make this country a bunch of centrists. Um, and you know, so as I said, this panel is about how education itself can reduce polarization. If polarization were to be reduced, probably a, a lot of these education policy issues that these panelists know a lot about uh, would be easier to solve, but that's not really what we're covering tonight. 
Um, we recognize that, that schools cannot be responsible for all of society's ills, right? This is part of the solutions exchange that we have as part of the DC Alliance of Greater Angels, where we look at a lot of solutions, including what many different sectors in society, in society can each contribute to reducing polarization. So K-12 education is just one part of a larger puzzle, not the silver bullet to solve everything. Um, and one thing that sometimes said is like more education can be better. We know from the data in this field that more education, if it does not go in a specific direction for reducing polarization, will do nothing and possibly work the other way. So there's data from an organization called More in Common that looks at just how distorted are people's views of the other side based on their education level. And for Republicans, there's like no impact. For Democrats, the more formal education they have, the more distortions they have about the other, the other party. Uh, and they also did a study looking at political tribes. We just divide up the country into tribes. And, and the ones that are the most extreme, these kind of political wings, less than 15% of the population, but they tend to be uh, wealthier and have more formal education uh, than, than the average American. So it does work kind of differently. So education is important, but education in which ways? Um, so I will kind of go ask a different question to, to each of our distinguished panelists. Uh, we'll, we'll, we'll kind of hop from, from topic to topic and cover hopefully a lot of ground before turning it over to you. So first, I want to ask a question of, of Melanie Miriam. So she is a school board member for Fairfax County. Um, has background in education policy and done a lot of community advocacy. So thank you for all your service. And I want to know kind of what Fairfax County Public Schools is doing about social media, what you'd like to see uh, happen uh, in order to reduce political polarization. And, and feel free to talk about other kind of avenues that, that Fairfax County public schools is taking to reduce polarization. Good evening, I'm Melanie Merritt. I'm on the Fairfax County School Board. I represent a portion of that county uh, called Hunter Mill, which is basically Vienna and Reston. And I started my career at the U.S. Department of Education at the Dawn of No Child Left Behind, so I bring that with me to you this evening in all my work. And I'm really glad, James, that you mentioned that schools are not in a vacuum. And whatever happens, um, you know, schools reflect the community. And issues like gun violence and improper use of social media, bullying, those are problems will not be solved in our schools alone. They are gonna be solved in the community. So this constantness that I've seen over my four years, so I got elected and, and started serving in 2020 and nine weeks in, COVID hit. And my experience has been that other government agencies and perhaps the community is expecting to do so much, literally from saving people's lives and public health to preventing gun violence, to preventing overdoses and opioids. And I am constantly pushing back to say, if we want to focus on instruction, everyone's got to take care of their own, their own turf, and we will handle instruction. So, you know, the, turning to social media, um, you know, social media is a business. The whole point of business, you know, is to make money and provide a good. And uh, I noted in your July grade where Angel's convening about social media and polarization, you even pointed this out, the social media is run by companies. Um, in fact, I will say the school board voted in August, my school board, I voted in August to join a multi-district litigation uh, pending against social media companies that's going on and came out of Northern California, and we are joining that class action work. Uh, and that's all I can say about that, but it, it shows you the extent to which we view the role of social media in youth and in our schools. I was on a, a panel a, a few weeks ago uh, hosted by students, our students who were running an entire day meeting about artificial intelligence. And I, my contribution to their very technical parts of what they were talking about was the comments. This idea that there are some things in our society, in our world, that belong to all of us. It, used to, you know, it came from like the environmentalist movement and continues, but here we have artificial intelligence, owned, you know, AI, chat GPT, owned by companies. Well, again, what's their main motivation? doesn't mean it can't be good, 
but the name motivation is different than the motivation of public services and the public good of, of education. So that's really the lens when I, when I think about social media. So finally, I, I can say that Fairfax County School certainly is doing, um, and, and by the way, I'm speaking on behalf of myself, and I'm not representing the school officially, so uh, please know that. But I will say, as my experience is that Fairfax County Public Schools, um, you know, we have curriculum that talks about making healthy choices because that's really what it's about. And if we deny students the opportunity to practice making healthy and safe choices, we are not serving them well for when they graduate. So that curriculum comes through health, it comes through social studies, it comes through civics, it comes through family life education, um, it comes through news literacy, but I will leave it to my colleague here to talk about that. And finally, the school division has policies and regulations, and I'll talk about that in the next round of questions. But we have a student rights and responsibilities regulation that details your digital literacy expectations, your, di your citizenship expectations, and what happens if you don't meet those expectations. So again, preparing students to make those healthy choices in a safe space because that's what they're supposed to be doing, right? Learning. Okay, I'll leave it at that. Thank you. Perfect. Thank you. And, and I think you set up Mike for the, the next question about news media and, or, and, and news literacy. And so what Mike Webb, uh, who's the Senior Vice President of Media and Marketing for the News Literacy Project, uh, was explaining you know, what, what you do and, and how you think that news literacy, and once you define that, uh, can be helpful for reducing polarization in K-12 education. All right, well, I want to uh, thank everybody involved for putting on this forum, and thank you, James, for inviting me to participate. Um, so news literacy is essentially uh, about helping people learn how to tell fact from fiction in the information they receive. And I think one of the, the great benefits of it is it helps people learn how to think critically. You, you get information, and you learn the skills to check it, to verify it, to see if, it come, if it's coming from a credible source. And then you know if it's trustworthy and if it's something you can act on or, or believe in. So uh, I think it's really an essential function uh, as far as that goes. Um, we think that news literacy helps inoculate you from falsehoods. It, it helps you learn how to um, do your own fact checking um, so that you can make sure you, what you're operating on and acting on is, uh, is good information. And then it, it also exposes people to different beliefs. We, have a number of products, uh, but one of them is something called, it's a newsletter called The Sift, and it, uh, it shares examples of misinformation that have been circulating in the week. It's for educators, and it gives them some prompts to talk about it with their students, and in the process of having these conversations in the classroom, students are uh, exposed to different points of view, and they, they learn that the other side just has different beliefs, they're not your enemy, they just think about things in a different way. They might have a different value set. Uh, they might prioritize different things uh, a little differently. But they're not uh, monsters. They're not out to destroy America. They just believe things uh, a little differently. So, um, and then just, I'll, I'll tell you a little bit more about what we do. We also have uh, our, our main tool for teaching news literacy is called Checkology, and it's an online program. Um, it's, it's a browser-based program where it has 19 different lessons and they uh, kind of walk you, we have a journalist who's the host or subject matter expert, and they walk you through all these different things that will sort of help you learn uh, different skills. So everything, the, the lessons cover everything from uh, you be the editor, which is one of my favorites because it puts the student in the position of being the editor and, and understanding uh, it's a car accident that's happened, and there's different witnesses, and you have to sort of put yourself in the position of being the editor, asking the questions, which, which witness is more credible than the other. Um, so that's one. There's, uh, we have so many. There's a, a harm and distrust, which is a new one, which sort of goes back and explores uh, the history of why uh, certain groups don't are distrustful of the media, and how the media has sometimes will get it wrong. Um, but we also have lessons about misinformation, uh, one about info, uh, info zones, so that you can understand the types, different types of information that are coming at you, like propaganda. Um, and then we have new lessons about health uh, information and science, 
So they're just things that are geared to open people's minds and help them think about, am I getting quality information that I can actually trust and act on? So that's what new service is. Okay, no, thank you. Um, so you can tell we're, we're covering lots of different topics, many different ways to reduce polarization. So I'm gonna set this one up with a little bit of context and then talk to our, our ask a question of uh, Mike Shirley right here, uh, who is the president of the Thomas B. Fordham Institute, a think tank focused on education policy. Um, so there's a fair amount of research in this field that shows that people tend to overestimate differences between those who vote like them and those who, who vote differently. Um, and, and this can have a, a fairly negative impact because if the other side is seen as threatening, behavior often follows that perception, the other side sees that behavior, and it can be a vicious cycle. And so a couple examples of this, which are sometimes called misperceptions or false polarization, is that, again, this group more in common found that the average American would think that 55% of those in the other party have extreme views. But really, when you ask them, it's more like 30%. So yeah, about 2x uh, the, the, the distortion. There's another study from Stanford called the Strengthening Democracy Challenge. Crowdsourced a lot of interventions, eight minutes or less, right? So pretty short interventions to try to reduce polarization. And they were testing for three different variables. Could this reduce uh, political animosity? Uh, how did this impact attitudes toward democratic norms? And how did this act uh, affect attitudes toward condoning political violence? And there were only three of the 25 that were effective for all three of those variables. Of those three, two of them explicitly focused on correcting these misperceptions. And so, I realize it's a little bit of a setup, but um, I'm interested uh, my, in your view of teaching students about these misperceptions or at least about kind of the people who are in each political party and if you think that would be helpful for reducing polarization. Well, first of all, thank you, James, for having me here and to the uh, students at George Mason and the Bridge Project. Uh, really, such a great effort, uh, this focus around depolarization. Though I feel bad, I probably shouldn't have worn a pink jacket to a depolarization event, because I feel like this color can be a little polarizing. I don't know, people either love it or hate it. Yeah, a little bit like a bow tie in the front row, right? So I should have gone gray uh, next time. No, so. uh, no, look, I think that sounds Yes, in, in the hands of a gifted teacher, I've been finding a way to teach about uh, those findings I think could be very powerful. I also like the notion of trying to teach uh, the, uh, what, what Amanda Ripley has written about around conflict entrepreneurs. You know, the, the notion that, look, there are people out there that are either for clicks or, or cash are in the business of trying to get people angry and to foment uh, uh, conflict, and I think you know, teenagers in particular, if, it, you know, if you're teaching teenagers to say, hey, these people are trying to manipulate you, I think that could be a, a winning uh, argument. But, you know, I, I do want to say, and I know you've acknowledged this, James, that, you know, that we, we do have this history in American education for at least 100 years, if not longer, of trying to solve all of our social ills through the schools. And let me just say that our track record is not great on that. Um, you know, that forever, I mean, whether it's from you know, the sex ed stuff, or the don't drink, or don't smoke, or don't do drugs. I mean, some of those have been more successful than others. Uh, but look, again, we're talking about kids, they're cynical, they're, you know, they know that we're trying to, you know, uh, whatever, brainwash them. Uh, it doesn't work for the most part, right? What works? Uh, it's, it's really teaching by example. And so I think the question that we have to ask for any institution, including our schools, is are we actually doing it? What you know, are we are we practicing what we're preaching? And so if we're saying that you know trying to respect people who have different views than us is the value, are we living by that? You know, and that can be from when things happen in a classroom that are difficult, kids you know misbehaving, and how do schools respond to that? To 
what's happening at the school administrator level, what notes are they sending out to what's happening at the school board? You know, are we, you know, are the people in positions of authority going out of their way to try to say, for example, hey, these are difficult issues, and, uh, you know, there are valid points on both sides, and we probably mostly agree on, on the, the key points, and the real differences are on the margins, and let's talk about very different from, you know, dumb dogging and, and look, I mean, schools are probably one of the most polarizing institutions today. I mean, we're having these very polarized debates, for example, about, you know, books in our libraries and books in the curriculum. If you say to somebody, you know, who has a concern about the age appropriateness of a book in an elementary school library, that you are a book banner, right, that's polarizing, okay? Uh, and there are examples on either side of it. So, you know, Versus saying, hey, we all agree that in America we want kids to have access to books and to you know, a variety of perspectives. And, you know, and we also probably all agree that, yeah, for elementary school kids, we gotta worry about age appropriateness and we don't want something that's graphic and you know. And so there's some books that are maybe tough calls about you know where you don't want. And so now let's talk about those tough calls. Versus you want to ban books, you know, you're a Nazi, or you know, you want to bring pornography into our schools, which is the conversation we're having today. And kids are listening. They're listening. So whatever we tell them in social studies class or health about how they should, you know, uh, try to adopt, you know, these depolarizing things, they're watching what we do, and that's what's going to matter more than anything. Okay. So so let, let's let's play with you know watching what what people do uh, in, in a slightly different context, mm -hmm. and also it can be related to, to policies. So so going back to, to social media, right? There's Kind of how students should react to social media and you know, how they can be more digitally literate. But there can also be a sense that you know, maybe there should be a quantity limit, you know, either no limits on, on cell phones in, in the classroom or an idea of just how much time people should spend on, on social media, which also would reflect back on how do adults uh, work you know, with social media or legally to their phones. Um, but I wonder, is that an area, kind of the amount of time that people spend on social media or whether people spend time on social media in the schools at all, uh, would that be on, on your agenda as something that could depolarize in the U.S.? Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, I, look, I think that that's an important conversation. And this is one of many reasons that we need to be worried about, you know, the amount of screen time and smartphone use and social media. You know, there's clear evidence that, you know, about a decade ago, when suddenly smartphone use among teenagers was ubiquitous, uh, that sleep, you know, went down markedly. We know that that's around the same time that these mental health challenges really started rising, way before the pandemic. Um, and you know, I think that there's, you know, good reason to think that's also partly why we were, even before the pandemic, starting to see test scores and student achievement and engagement. And apps, you know, and, and attendance all trending down. So yeah. Uh, now, what I don't know, and I just literally don't know, and you might know from you know better, is to what degree is you know our kids using social media to follow politics or to be polarized around politics in the same way that we know that some adults have been. And you know, I think we have all heard the very scary stories of some people getting radicalized on social media in a way that you know is quite upsetting. I, I just don't, I personally don't know, I haven't followed up close enough to know if that's sort of very rare or if that's something that's become more mainstream. Um, and again, making it clear to kids, you know, I, I always thought with the smoking stuff or any of these messages, right, it's probably a, a good message, and I think there's some research, is, you know, hey, these big businesses are trying to manipulate you and, you know, don't let them win kind of argument, right? Same thing here, there's people online who are trying to make money off you, don't let them win, you know, um, might be something that's compelling. But, uh, but I, I have to say, there's, there's lots of reasons to be worried. In terms of using phones in the schools, I mean, I, I think there could be some positive uses of technology, and that could be one of them. But I, I feel like most schools are, are moving in the direction of saying, hey, kids have got to keep the phones in their pockets or even, you know, put them somewhere at the front of the class because it's distracting. And, you know, we all know. Uh, we want attention, and learning is about attention. Uh, phones are not good for that. So just like I said earlier that, you know, education doesn't happen in that vacuum, discussions about 
appropriateness in books, they can't happen. We have to acknowledge the extreme political environment, at least in Virginia, that we're in. The fact that we're even talking about book banning in the year 2023, like we as a society have decided to put that to rest decades ago. I do have opinions about what might be too much or too little. Anything from you know, I, I, uh, trauma that a child might experience in a book that I'm reading. Is that too much for a kid? Is that too much for a kid who's gone through COVID to read a youth novel about a parent dying? But I can't even bring that conversation to the table as an elected official because there is such a loud group of, of a, a minority voice that is screaming and calling me a pornographer mm -hmm. or a groomer, which in and of itself is disgusting and triggering of people. Oh, did mm -hmm. I just get, did they cut the mic on me? I can project, but I don't know if it's still on it. Yeah. Um, but, um, the, yeah, okay. We can hear you. I thought you said what I wanted to say. Okay. Yeah. So they can hear? Okay. Online. Discussions, but even students who come to my school board meetings get veered at. So, like, that's the reality. So, how do we have? You know, we can we can model it. So, um, you know, we've got all these, and I, I I so appreciate you know the research that you're bringing because we have this rugged individualism in America, and you know, cell phone use. I mean, how many times have I been on my phone? Like, there's just um, a lot of forces at play for our families and uh, most people. And I just looked up there's a children's book called Most People. And it was written for parents to be able to share with their children. Like, even though you hear these terrible things, most people are kind. Most people want community. Most people want the best. But that's not what sells, and that's not what grabs our attention, unfortunately. So, all right, thank you. started and 
to a large extent, is a, a very much a dialogue effort at, at this point. How to have better conversations, which can be very helpful, but it's also extremely hard to scale and can be kind of obtuse. It's like, you go to this learning and it's kind of complicated and learn all these things and maybe at the end of it you learn how to have a conversation better. Meanwhile, the stuff that I remember from schools that may have had, had social impact, um, you know, like reduce, reuse, recycle, right? Things that are very quick. You know, sometimes they might not be as effective, like don't do drugs, like okay, I, I don't know if that was a, 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 as, as useful. But, but still, you know, it was very pithy, very to the point. And uh, our, our social media person here, you know, had, showed a video of me where I said, you know, be civil, which is you know, like a little kind of mnemonic for not actually be civil necessarily, but telling your stories relating to their values and listening, so SVL. Civil, which came, comes from a, a Stanford professor. So maybe for Mike Webb, I, I don't, I don't know, because you're, you're, you're a communications guy, but right, I mean, you're all in communications in, in, in a way, right? I mean, as as a politician, as someone who's been a podcaster for 15 years, you all can communicate extremely well. And when it comes to having better conversations, I guess, how would you kind of make that again? Catchy or pithy in, in a way that, that could relate to to people and not be this kind of like you need to go through these hours and hours of classes to come out on the other side and maybe have a little bit better conversation. Well, so I'll, I'll start and um, I'm going to make a plug for uh, my organization. Please <laughs> visit newslit.org because we're going to have a conversation about this very topic. Um, we're we're going to have some webinars. We always try and put together some webinars in advance of Thanksgiving because we know family's going to be coming together. And you know, many of you are going to have that uncle who believes something that is uh, kind of a crazy conspiracy theory. And we want you to have a great time while you're all together and not be arguing about things like that. Um, but one of the things that we'll teach during this session is we call it PEP. It's patience, empathy, and persistence. And it's really a matter of the patient side is the person didn't get to their conspiracy beliefs just like that overnight. Um, something pulled them down a rabbit hole. So it fulfilled some kind of emotional or cognitive belief they have about the world. And so you have to understand you're not going to change their mind overnight. So, so be patient with that. And then be empathetic. I mean, put yourself in their shoes. Think about what caused them to go down this rabbit hole. Um, and what you might say that might help bring them out. It's going to be a slow process, um, so that's where we, that's where persistence comes in. Um, you're, if you're really committed to having the dialogue, keep talking to them. Don't try to change their minds overnight. Listen to them. Listen to them and maybe do some research and say, well, I understand what you said and what you found, but I found something that's a little different. And I wonder if we can talk about this just to understand each other a little better. So I, I, that's, I really encourage people who, who uh, are interested to attend this session because uh, it's, it's fun uh, and it's also really, it'll give you some ideas to, to have these conversations. Well, James, I'd like to add that you're, you're looking for a pithy, fun, little mnemonic. And the thing is, at least in Virginia, there's nothing pithy and simple about our governance. Um, this year I'm on the ballot and I put together this to show that there are 14 different seats that voters are going to have to select this fall and 12 of them don't have a party affiliation next to them even though they've been endorsed. And there's been redistricting. So try and get that into a soundbite, into something fun and pithy. And by the way, we vote every year in Virginia. So you think you voted, you're voting again. <laughs> you know, what I think, and James, this gets to another question that you put together about um, you know, what could school boards do to help people get heard? I think helping people understand the purpose of these governing bodies. And, you know, look, I have a Master's in Public Policy. This is my jam. I love this stuff. Not everybody does, and that's okay, but this whole democracy, you know, experiment is based on people understanding it. And you really, in Virginia at least, you've got to understand that the school board makes policy, the school board hires a superintendent, and the school board is responsible for $3 billion of taxpayer money in Fairfax, Virginia. 
So when people come at me and say, why can't you hire this person? And why can't you fix this crosswalk to school? And why can't you ban this book? Well, we have policies. We have policies. If you want to challenge a book, here's the process. Come and do it. Instead of coming to a school board meeting and you know flailing it around. We actually have a process and we'll respect your input. We have committees that look at textbooks that we're considering publishing. And you know what? The public can view them for months in advance. And you could be on a committee. So I think if people know that the school board is supposed to reflect the community's values and the superintendent is the one operationalizing that, then you know who to go to and maybe people won't feel so frustrated and then they might actually want to join in because there's actually lots of really amazing stuff happening in schools. So I'll leave it there and put it back to your pithy, your search for the, the pithiness. <laughs> yeah, may, maybe someone in the audience can, can make that, that pithy. <laughs> um, okay, so... We actually have 25 minutes for questions, all right? So lot, lots of engagement. I think we'll, we'll go, you know, one one in person, one online. Let's kind of go go back and forth. And yeah, Lindsay can pass pass the mic. So, so we have a question from the around. floor. Anybody on the floor? Hi. Is it on? I think we're on. Hello. Yep. Oh, okay. Uh, I am a senior. I am an inspiring educator. I taught first grade, fifth grade, and social ed. Um, my question is, we already are experiencing a teacher shortage, and how do we bring teachers to the class when we, uh, at our, me as an educator, already feel extremely scared to be in the classroom um, because of the politicization that what I'm teaching could get me fired. Mm -hmm. Now, such a great question. First of all, thank you. Yeah. So glad that you're going to teach you. Please don't take it off. Uh, look, I think we've done a terrible job uh, communicating to future teachers about what's going on in our schools and our profession. and. Look, again, it's back to the conflict entrepreneurs. You know, the media, no offense to the media, right? I mean, how they want, they report on the, you know, fights over books and all the other, you know, culture war stuff because, you know, it gets clicks. And so the perception becomes that that's all that's happening in there. Now, I mean, Melanie, I'm curious of what you think. I mean, you, you have to deal with it on the school board, but I suspect in the actual day-to-day -day life of schools, I mean, at least I see this through my head of two, my two boys, there's, that stuff is, there's not a lot of that stuff, right? I mean, you know, kids go to school and they're doing school. And it's, it's just like it's always been. And, and, you know, because again, these fights are on the margins, but we have this tendency in social media and in other media to bring it into the center. And so we create this impression that these jobs are horrible or you know, impossible. Or, and when, when, you know, probably you're not going to have to deal with that too much. Um, I don't know. I think it's the same message that we send sometimes, even around teacher. Hey, or teacher conditions. I mean, I don't know. We just always are like, oh, it's such a hard job, and it is a hard job, right? It doesn't get paid well. The pay actually is better than most people think. You know, we, I, I'm, I, I'm uh, involved in a journal called Education Next. You survey people and you say, you know, are teachers unpaid? People say yes, and they say, well, how much do you think they get paid? And most people will say, well, starting salaries are thirty thousand dollars. You say, well, no, it's actually on the average is fifty thousand dollars. Now that still may not be enough, but wow, that's a lot more than people think. And maybe people knew that salaries were decent, especially in places on like here that are, have better cost of living, more people would say, well, it's not, it doesn't sound as bad as I thought it was. So I mean, we have this media narrative that we haven't done a good job of pushing back against. Well, thank you. I, I think there's, there's two things. One is that classroom experience. And I can say, so I represent uh, about 130,000 people, 17,000 students, and I by no means you know, talk with all of them. Tonight, I just visited my about 25th back to school event because that's about how many schools I represent. And I go because that's where the parents are and the families are and I want to hear what's happening. And I will say, and, and staff, you know, most people are very pleased and their concerns are not very, you know, uh, my student needs this, whether they're neurodivergent or they have a social emotional or they're really interested in an academic area. But know that teachers in Virginia and Fairfax anyway are concerned when the governor changes social studies standards to say, for instance, let's not teach Martin Luther King Day, or let's teach that you know slavery was not as bad as it really was in the heart of, of slavery in America. 
They are. I just talked with a teacher last week, last week, a sixth grade teacher, who said, what's coming at me? What's going to change? So you are right to ask those questions, but it's not only your responsibility. And this gets into that whole bigger picture. What are colleges of education doing? What are, but the other thing I want to get back to is society's view. So I went to a neighbor today to ask about putting a yard sign. And I said, oh, can I put a yard sign? It's just about elections. It wasn't even about education. It was just, I signed for instance that said, like, these are the election dates because there's early voting and in-person voting and mail-in voting and, you know, all this stuff, um, which is great. So, he, so I said, but it's nonpartisan. And he said, well, I don't, have, I don't have kids in schools. It doesn't matter. I said, no, 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 you pay your taxes. And in Fairfax, two-thirds of the residents do not have children in our schools at any given time. So those are my primary constituents. Now, it's harder to see them because I'm at the schools, right? But society's view, and, and the, the person said, um, you know, I pay a lot of taxes. So I grew up on Long Island where my parents paid three times the amount of taxes, but my class size was never bigger than 18. And my children, so I have an 8th grader and a 5th grader, they've constantly had kids a uh, class size of 29. Mm -hmm. And I've got parents advocating to me constantly right now, my first grade class is 29. So it's all of these things that if we really want to invest in what's best in kids, we've got to align the revenue stream with the expectations of what it's going to take. And by the way, General Assembly just released its report showing that for decades, Virginia has not fully has been using incorrect funding formulas for decades, which we've known on the ground, and now we have data. But all this to say, and by the way, Mr. Petrilli and I worked together through the Department of Education 20 years ago, and so we come from different points of view, but I will say that I don't believe that the that public education has ever been fully funded enough to warrant looking at the options yet. So until we do that, I, I think it's going to be hard to attract teachers like you. But I'll tell you, SCPS is hiring, and I'll talk to you. <laughs> And I just want to add, and only because it's specific to your question, um, one of our goals is to provide resources that can be taught in red states and blue states. We are strictly nonpartisan. We were founded by uh, an LA Times reporter who, who did investigative <laughs> stories uh, that won Pulitzer Prizes and exposed, uh, bad, uh, exposed bad things by Democrats and by Republicans. So I, I would encourage you to go to newslit.org or uh, we have a sister site for the general public called rumorguard.org because they have examples of misinformation on the left and on the right. So you can have these discussions with your students and, and you know hopefully feel comfortable that you're not uh, that you're not taking sides, but you're trying to help your students think through how to think about these issues. Real quick, just to say, to finish my own story about the history speakers, though, there's good news here, which is that they listened and they have fixed them. I mean, they, you know, the MLK day, the, you know, and, and the state board that still has appointees from the previous Democratic governor, you know, they worked at it. There was a big political article that just came out that said, hey, certainly compared to a place like Florida, Virginia found a way to come to consensus. And it's not going to lose everybody, but, you know, there was a depolarization that finally happened. I mean, they're definitely went off the rails for a while. But, you know, it's fun. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so you have a question? P E P one oh nine? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, a question from Jesse. <laughs> um, we tend to diagnose social ills and prescribe education. Instead of just diagnosing what students need, what if? What, if any, is the value of intergenerational voices in policy and curriculum development to the established? Should be, and if yes, how? Do we get young folks involved a solution beyond just teaching them? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 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 If I understand the question correctly, I, I think civics education and kind of reintroducing young people to how our government works and just the basic uh, things is one way to sort of surround that. Um, I'm not sure that I got the entirety of the question, though. Yeah, how to so get, get young people involved in making policy and solving these problems. Well, so by having these discussions with them so that they sort of develop an interest. Uh, one thing we find is 
we have a program where journalists come to a classroom and speak. And students, when they find out what a, what a journalist does and how often it's about piecing a puzzle together, they develop that interest in that. They want to go deeper and they you know, have an interest in doing journalism. So I think for policy issues, when you understand some of the solutions and approaches and differences, I think that that's a powerful, powerful way to go. I think it was also about bringing uh, education to the curriculum development, not just in each case, but how we include that in the curriculum development. Yeah, so it's interesting because the, the question talked about intergenerational experiences and only mentioned youth. And while I, I'm going to talk about that in a second, that's great. I, you know, even as a parent, I, I miss those elders that I think some cultures, even in our community, are really good about bringing in. And we have some programs um, that will bring older volunteers, retired volunteers in. But um, I wanted to say that what I, I almost find myself pleading with students not to give up on voting because it seems like a lot of stuff is dysfunctional right now. But I do think that voting is the answer. And so we have a student rep on our school board, lovely student. She's in 11th grade. I talk with her regularly. We talked the other day. She wants to get free meals for all of our kids because a few schools have it, and she knows that it will help more kids and reduce the stigma if all kids have it. She says, how do I do that? I said, well, we have a federal advocacy avenue. Okay, who do I talk to? I said, well, Congress can't even pass a budget right now, so like, they're probably not going to be open to hearing about how to feed hungry kids. And, and the youth have to get through that and still hang on to keep going. As far as teaching in the classroom, I think we are at an age in, where we need to, you know, teachers are facilitators of knowledge and not just there to be lectured at. And I do know we do that a lot in Fairfax County because that's part of teacher education and ongoing professional development. Yeah, and I think the number one, we should listen to students. I mean, it's hard at scale, but you can at least survey them. And I think one of the most important questions is, do you feel like you can speak your own mind about your opinion uh, without fear of, you know, the teacher or your students shaming you for what you say? And, you know, we know there's been a huge issue in higher ed where there's a sense that, you know, there are, there is not campus free speech, you know, that people feel like they're going to get canceled and shouted down. And that has crept down into high school as well. So I think that's one area where you say, all right, you know, do kids feel like we're, we're walking the walk on, on some of that as well? I think the uh, online question was pretty apropos because we have Eli here who has uh, actually been really active. I, I did read your uh, your post uh, column, which was really inspiring. Thank you. Um, and and so I think that it's it's fantastic that we have you know especially a, a generation that's really engaged, right? And we should absolutely be, be listening to them. Um, I also uh, you know I I have been focused on. Uh, what's going on with organizations in our country and, and how generally, generally, generational, generational differences and changes over time have been affecting uh, our organizations and the people who are coming into them, right? And, and young people coming into organizations are having some, some issues based on uh, their, uh, you know, extreme onlineness and uh, you know what COVID did in terms of uh, isolating folks and moving a lot of their conversations and their social lives, uh, and, and obviously we're already seeing that. Um, and but one of the uh, the driving forces behind this uh, seems to be that we are we might be putting a little bit of pressure on our kids to become these high achievers. Uh, in, in ways like it, in order to get into college, it seems right now you almost have to start your own nonprofit. And that, that's a huge uh, trend, right? And, and so kids are actually, um, they're working in, they, they don't have summer jobs uh, at the rates that they used to. It's a lot lower than, than that used to be. Um, and they are, they're doing enrichment projects, right? But they, those kind of have a different uh, relationship to authority and, um, and they're not, Understand, they're, they're not forming relationships in the same way. Uh, so I guess I, I, I wonder um, how we balance that and, and you know, enable them to become leaders of, of tomorrow, but also not put so much pressure on them that they feel this need to, to become that right away, and, and which I think is also contributing to you know, mental, excuse me, mental health crisis.
again, I just think it's all really important that, you know, it again gets back to what is it that we are celebrating in our schools, who is getting lauded, you know, I mean, you're saying that, you know, kids are getting to selected colleges, the ones that, uh, you know, are creating these new nonprofits, or maybe that are, you know, taking positions in a public way that are very polarizing, right? They're getting attention for, you know, on the left for being a social justice activist, or on the right for what, you know, and, you know, even what is the college asking me in the essay for you to write about? And what is it, I mean, these are the messages, the, this, this is the true curriculum. You know, there's been an idea forever about, what do you call it, the implicit curriculum, or the, you know, it's, that's the real stuff. And, uh, and so, of course, we should pay attention to, you know, what's in the civics curriculum, and what's in the health curriculum. But what actually happens day by day? What are the subtle messages we're sending? And I think a lot of places we're saying, if you're in blue America, you know, you're going to get a better chance to succeed if you are, you know, you know, agreeing with the sort of whatever, the social justice, this matter. If you're in blue, red America and you're coming down on the MAGA side, that's going to be celebrated. That's a problem. So I think, I think the, I'm sure some of you are all at the Eagle Bank Arena, right? Right here. Have you been to Eagle Bank, to Eagle Bank Arena right here at Virginia Second? Yeah. So the capacity of Eagle Bend Arena is 10,000 people. In Fairfax County Public Schools, we have 66,000 students who are eligible for free and reduced price lunch. That is over six times the capacity of that stadium. When we think about how to meet kids' desires and needs, some of them, it's just basic. It's like literally the survival. Then we talk about, we were having a discussion before about teaching neurodivergent kids. My child is dyslexic. He has talents. We are figuring out how to reach all these students. So maybe, you know, if a student is just trying to survive and eat, they're probably not going to figure out how to do that enrichment project in the summer. And that's great that some students can, and we need to challenge. That's those kids' strengths and those kids' opportunities. But again, education does not exist absent of that scenario. So it's just, it's tough for me to come back and you know, I represent those kids as a third of our school division. And that's different than it was about 20 years ago, so I, I just I want to point that out, too. I actually have a question for Mike. Oh, Can I right. ask? Which Mike? <laughs> this Mike. Mike, I was wondering, in the age where news is essentially all digital, is there a difference, as you see it, between social media and what was traditionally called earned media, which was by trained journalists that would write in, you know, subscription publications or newspapers. Can you speak to that? Yeah, they're, they're very different. Uh, social media is uh, mostly a network to sort of relate to one another, and news gets posted on social media, um, but you don't know where it's necessarily coming from. You don't know if it's been verified, fact-checked, uh, you don't know how accurate it is. Whereas um, old media or, or modern media, and there's many, many forms of news media, you know, podcasts, uh, radio, NPR, uh, print, everything. So I really hesitate to use media. But um, that's going to be information that has been vetted um, by people who are professionals. They are going to ask uh, a wide variety of sources, questions. Uh, they're going to try and, and put the, the information in the proper context so that it's, it's actually useful and balanced and, and fair. They're going to try and be fair. They're going to be as unbiased as they possibly can. Um, so it's very different. It's, it's information that's been vetted. Social media is, can be a great way to communicate, to find out different things. I'm a football fan, and when uh, there's a game going on, I love to use Twitter because it'll tell me that the player's been injured way before the announcers will. <laughs> but, um, but we know that Twitter is a... Mess, so I'll say very <laughs> understatedly. Um, so you've got to use social media very carefully and with a high degree of skepticism. Um, whereas more traditional media, you can it's way more trustworthy because the information has been vetted and produced by professionals. Well, well I, I ask because it just seems like it's hard to get vetted local news. Yeah. And so how do we, you know, in this conversation about students where everything is digital for them? You know, 
how are you, is your organization made that distinction? Are you making that distinction? Like, just, I'd love to hear some tips about how to manage that. Um, well, um, I don't, I mean, so our approach to that is to really just teach people what is quality news. And it's some of the things I just stated where, like I'm looking at, at, I'm thinking about TikTok. That's what keeps me running through my mind. And I understand that young people are using that in ways that, you know, we never envisioned. Um, I read recently that more young people are using TikTok uh, in place of Google. So if they want to find a restaurant, they'll go to, to TikTok to find that. So it, it, that's a genuine use, and maybe it's, hopefully, it's getting them to a place they want to. So there, there's useful information there. But it's not news. It's not going to inform you and make you prepared to, to vote and know exactly you know where what the issues are and where the candidates are. So that's where you're going to need to turn to traditional news. And again, it's 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 you know are the story balanced? Are they in context? Is it really quality vetted vetted credible information? Mm -hmm. What question? One, one last question. Question from the Zoom. Online. Yeah. Um, this is a bit of an open question. What will happen to our democracy if we don't stop this polarization? What will happen to our democracy if we don't stop this polarization and the efforts to control what happens in education? So what will happen to our democracy if we don't stop this polarization, polarization and the efforts to control what happens in education? Quest from Christina. Well, I, mean, I, I, I can, from, from a polarization standpoint, I'm a little unclear about the second half of the question. I don't think I'd also be uh, sorry, capable of answering it. But the dangers of extreme polarization involve democratic breakdown and fiscal violence. Mm -hmm. that's, that's the end goal, of, you know, the, the end extreme you know, result of political polarization. Right. Uh, <laughs> and I think the question, you know, for any institution, including the schools, is what, what can we do to keep that from happening? And I, I do think, you know, being honest with young people, that that is something, you know, we, we can't take it for granted. You know, we've had a good run, 250 years almost, um, but, you know, it's up to us to keep it going. And, uh, you know, it is a fragile thing. And, you know, I think that's one reason we learn about countries around the world where this has happened, but you know, we're seeing it right here as well. So no, I, I think let's let's be honest with young people. That it is gonna be up to them, right, to keep this from happening. Yeah, I, I used to think democracy is a participatory sport participatory sport. Have you heard that? Mm -hmm. But you know, I, I think that it's okay to want people who are qualified for the jobs of making public policy and governing. And I think we've seen in the last few years that seemingly anyone can get elected with no experience at all. And it turns out you actually need experience to run a civil society and engage people. Um, you know, public policy is my interest, and so this I really enjoy this work. There's other value for having people with different experiences on a body like a school board. That's the purpose. It's supposed to be governed by the residents, by the people. But when it comes to like professional lawmakers, I don't make laws, I make policies, and this is technically a part-time job, um, but it's people who get a full-time salary and staff and do this like Congress members, when they can't pass a budget, you know, that's the work. Like if you can't do the job, it, you know, and people need to expect more of those people and demand that they get that done so people have a job on October 1st. So I think if we could raise our expectations of these elected officials and hold them accountable, maybe that will renew that spirit in democracy as those, yes, the young people definitely, again, keep voting and keep coming, and, and I, I have high hopes too. And um, yes, high hopes. <laughs> um, I just, I think you have to be well informed if you're gonna maintain democracy. You have to be well informed when you go into the polls and that and know who you're voting for and why, and it needs to be based on solid quality information. You can believe we can have different values and different priorities. 
Um, but you can't believe that. Yeah, I'm ready to lie here, but because uh, I, I just don't want to jump into the partisan side. But you but listen, every the election was not stolen, and you have to start there because there's no evidence that the last presidential election was stolen. You can believe that Donald Trump is a better candidate, um, but sometimes candidates win, sometimes they lose. Uh, and he, by all accounts, uh, including the U.S. government, including the courts who have heard cases, he lost. So people need to accept that, and you go back out, and if he's your candidate, you do everything you can to get him uh, elected. You go knock on doors, you sign petitions, you donate, you do, but you participate in the democratic process, and that's, that's what I think will be the, the saving grace of democracy. I'll end it, so how do you summarize all this? I, mean, I guess I'll tell you a little story of, you know, kind of just, just putting this panel together and kind of how, how I've evolved uh, in this. I mean, I think, and not to completely d dismiss it, but I've kind of approached this kind of like, I don't know, you know, the game like Operation or something, you're just kind of like mm -hmm. trying to get this like little, little part out, and it's like kind of like a laser, like, okay, how can we change health class in this little way to, you know, add this, this out, you know, uh, social media and how, how to work it, or, you know, how do I change civics a little bit? And I think Melanie and, and Mike Petrilli in particular, right, have, have talked a lot about context, right? All of these social ills, and I mean, obviously, you can't change everything, you know, pick, pick one's battles. But I think this, this context is important and these, these subtle messages that you talked about, I think that fits in, into this. But still, you know, mnemonics are, 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 are near and dear to my heart. <laughs> no. so, so, yeah, that, uh, that, that was, that was uh, So thank you. Good thing. All right, and good night. Thank you very much. Yeah. All right. <laughs>